open discussion today with our, our two panelists. Before turning to those panelists, um, just a, a few points uh, to outline how this will run. Um, the panelists and I will have a discussion for about 30 minutes around the topic. Um, and then we'll have about 30 minutes for a question and answer session with you, um, those who've logged in uh, to, to follow the webinar. You can pose questions by going down to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and just type your question in there. I would ask you just try and keep the questions short. It'll be easier for us to, uh, to follow them online. <clears throat> um, we're live streaming this webinar on Facebook and we're also recording it. Um, so it'll be available later um, um, for those who are unable to log in today. Uh, but maybe some of you want to go back to it later. So that'll be available on uh, the website of the, <clears throat> of the two co-hosts who I'll introduce in a second. Um, our topic today is <laughs> new business models for human rights. Open Global Rights, the online platform that I hope a number of you have seen is co-hosting this with the Rights Collab. Um, the topic is... Uh, We've run a number of pieces on our website around uh, around this issue. Um, if you like, it's driven by the sense that um, there's an old model of human rights work. Of course, this model, which I'll describe in a second, was never um, never accurately described all human rights work. But there is a sense that there was an old model of human rights work, and by that, its its key features, if you like, were the fact that the people involved tended to be professional. Um, and in, were accused of um, being uh, members of an elite, uh, which may or may not have been true. Um, it was driven by advocacy, uh, reporting, public reports and advocacy, particularly through the media. Um, law played an important part in, 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 or plays an important part in the work of the of, of human rights organizations that, that fit this dominant. Um, these are organizations that are funded largely through grants um, particularly, although not in all cases, from grants arriving from abroad, foreign funding. And these are organizations that had um, an international perspective. They relied on international standards and international law, and they built international networks. Now, I want to emphasize again this model that I'm describing never accurately described all human rights work. But if you like, it was uh, a dominant model, and to some extent, it arguably remains a dominant model, at least in people's public perception of human rights groups. Today's discussion <clears throat> recognizes the fact that times have changed. Um, in many countries, there's restrictions on foreign funding for human rights and other forms of civil society activity. There's a widespread sense of failure over traditional advocacy techniques and public reporting. Um, there's new pressures for groups to prove that they are, have a, they are local and have a local constituency that they are not simply representative of so-called uh, elite voices. Um, and of course, in the face of <clears throat> uh, populist attacks and pressures in a number of countries, civil society generally has been facing in a number of countries growing restrictions on its activity. So given that background and given um, the, the model that has been dominant to date, the question for us is, is about looking at, or isn't it time to look at, new models of doing this form of work our panelists today um, are Dimitrina Petrova. Um, her full biography is online, so I'll just briefly say about Dimitrina that she's the founding director of the European Roma Rights Center in Budapest. She was also the executive director of the Equal Rights Trust in London, but she's now leading a project for the Bulgarian Helsinki Committee to consolidate human rights constituencies in Bulgaria and Macedonia. Dimitrina, I'm very happy to have you with us today. And secondly, Almut Rokowanski. Uh, Almut has been working with activists and their organizations in the former Soviet Union for over 15 years, particularly in the area of women's rights. Um, and since 2012, she's been particularly focused in her research and work on searching for alternative um, ways to mobilize resources for these organizations. Uh, Almut, welcome, very pleased to have you with us today. <coughs> Okay, so to get right into the subject, Dimitrina, I've described 
um, the key features of a so-called dominant model of human rights advocacy. If you agree with that very brief description that I gave, what, what would you see as its key weaknesses and also what strengths did it have? Thank you, uh, David. Key weaknesses and key strengths. Well, um, they, they both are related to uh, the fact that that old model, if we can agree that there is one, uh, reflected a different era. Uh, we, uh, we should probably, uh, to me, what makes this model old is the fact that it took the advancement, the global advancement of democracy and the global validity of international human rights law for granted. It was an acknowledged framework where even um, rogue states, even states that were dictatorships could be held to account. So it was a global, not just climate, but a global um, framework of legitimacy, which was taken for granted by the human rights groups, by these groups that you described as the dominant model. And they actually reflected those times. Now, and that was their strength. But since the times changed, what, what was, what used to be the strength became now a weakness because the times are different. Now, most people would agree, I hope with me, that we can no longer take the, the global advancement of democracy for granted as we used to do back in, uh, after the Cold War, let's say, uh, after the end of the Cold War uh, back in the 1990s. Nor can we so strongly uh, rely on the framework of international human rights law. These things are, uh, are uh, eroding democracy, inter uh, international human rights law. And to the extent this is so, Actually, this, is, this becomes now the fundamental limitation. I wouldn't even, I, 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 I'd be a bit reluctant to call it a weakness, but a, a limitation or a growing irrelevance for, the, for this historical moment of, of, of the old model. And therefore, if we need to, so I think we should think about the, the, uh, the global political environment and the models of human rights uh, uh, activism very much in uh, a, a, as related. Can and I just ask derive the, mo the models, uh, let's say analysis of the model weaknesses from the analysis of, of the global environment. Can I just ask you very briefly, uh, Dimitrina, you ran in the 1990s, the European Roman Rights Center in Budapest, uh, a, a well-known human rights organization working on a difficult issue in that part of the world. Did you find at the time what, what you're describing, this legitimacy, this sense that um, of acceptance, because you, you, you definitely found that in that era, your work wasn't challenged in the way it would, have, it would be today. Was that a real experience for you in the 90s? Absolutely. I'm talking from real experience. Uh, it, it's a different zeitgeist now. Times have changed. Um, back in the 90s, and probably I'm going into a slightly different issue, but back in the 90s, the human rights advocates like myself were uh, sometimes referred to as, let's say, uh, you know, traitors of national interest and so on. But this was done by those extreme ultra-nationalist fringes of society. Today, uh, that's no longer the case. Today, when human rights activists like me and, you know, and actually everybody, in, at least in my part of the world, are called traitors and are called to... Um, uh, to question, uh, you know, their work is, is not valued in, in the way it was before. Now, the, the, there's a certain degree of, of delegitimation. There's no, uh, the, the, the public legitimacy of human rights work is diminishing. It's not entirely gone, but it's diminishing. Okay. And that's very clearly related to, to global trends. Okay, uh, turning you to you, uh, Elmut. Can you, are, are there um, distinguishing features of a new model for human rights work? Are there certain things you would point to, given Dimitrina's uh, argument that we're in new times, which would you know, mark out the new model of human rights advocacy? 
I think there's certainly not just one new model. There's so many models and they're not all new. I mean, some of them have been with us for a very long time since the 19th century. Um, so there are lots and lots of models, but I think one thing that all new models, if they want to be truly an innovation and an improvement on what we had, that they have to be, they have to be a lot more serious about intersectionality. And they have to be a lot more serious about nothing about us without us. Uh, like one, for example, the old human rights model, uh, when you mentioned its weaknesses, one of them was it had a huge blind spot when it came to women's human rights um, and also other intersectional issues. And then occasionally one or another marginalized group would become fashionable and the old model would sort of pick it up, but then its format didn't actually work really well for them. So what would the new models have to be? They'd have to, they have to be by the same people, you know, who are actually, who are actually affected by this. And, and that is a big challenge for us. And if only because, you know, we're still the same people doing this work. We're still sitting here. We as elites, um, we, you know, we try to reflect this in, in our hiring and in our internal values, but off, we, we see this, this is often failing. Uh, we don't still listen enough to the voices of grassroots organizers who are from the same communities who are affected and who tell us how they best protect the rights of their community or, or just of themselves. But so, so, so I would say that the fundamental thing would be a, a much more sort of like nothing without us, nothing about us without us. So you're speaking about, um, if you like, uh, being more local in a sense, but or being local, more... Local is one thing, but, you know, let's not, let's not forget the fact that local, wherever we go, there are also elites there. And, and we have to take, we have to look very closely, who is it really who's doing this work? Um, and are you really empowering those who are themselves affected by these conditions? And are we listening to them? And are we allowing them to set the agenda and, and to drive the agenda? Okay, but if we can agree, Dimitrina, if we can agree with Almut's point that there's a necessity um, to prioritize and to amplify the voice of people affected, um, in, in essence, going um, deeper and more local. Um, I don't think anyone would argue with the importance of doing that, but is there a risk that that focus um, detracts from the international networking which has characterized human rights work and which has, if you like, given visible expression to that idea of international solidarity which some would argue is at the core of human rights work. Um, do, you, do you see a risk there or not? I do. I see a risk there. But let me first comment on, um, on what uh, uh, Almut said. I, I think intersectionality and uh, nothing about us, uh, without us, and basically participation, the, vic the, the voice of, of, of the grassroots is uh, not new. I, I, I I think in the times which we, which I at least would refer to as the good old times of the old model, let's say the 1990s, these things were there. They were already happening. They were, in fact, they were articulated as a need back in, back then, I think. Uh, uh, and even, uh, and it's a, it's not something which distinguishes the old and the new, I believe. Uh, it, it's a process which, in which I see a continuity in that regard. In, in what Omut talked about, I see a continuity, not, not a, a, a disruption uh, and, 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 uh, of the kind I see when we talk about uh, the, the global dominance of a democratic value system, or at least the belief that this is the valid framework, and what we have now. Okay. So I, I see at this level, I see a real shift in human rights activism and therefore the need for new, uh, the conversation of new models. While in what Almut says, I rather see a continuity. I see those issues articulated already in the 90s, including women and so on, the grassroots, the voice of, of the, the weakest. And we are not there yet because even in this conversation of empowerment, <laughs> it, it, it comes from the elite that wants to, X wants to empower Y, you know? Okay, we are okay, not but, in a place hmm. where the powerless rise from the bottom. But, but her point about, um, I've paraphrased it as going deeper and local. Um, surely that's one response to the populist attacks which are that human rights groups following the 
older dominant model um, uh, were out of touch and represented an elite. I mean, it's a natural response to that. Um, so even if it was there in the 90s, isn't it true to say now that there's added pressure to in these new models to prove local relevance? And is that um, an, is that a unambiguously good thing to go back to the earlier question? Is this for me? Um, okay. The, uh, uh, Dimitrina, I'll come back to you in a second. Uh, okay. So Dimitrina. Go ahead, Dimitrina. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's yes and no. Now, uh, I would relate this to the kinds of threats human rights groups face. Uh, and, and I see five types of threats. First, and probably very, very important, if, if not most important, is the threat coming from the public. And that's the loss or the diminishing of, of public, of popular legitimacy of the human rights movement, of human rights groups. And the answer to this, really, the strategy to address this is really enlarging, building a constituency. And that's exactly what I have now devoted my, the rest of my career to, uh, to, to doing. That's one thing. But the other thing is the second thread is the thread coming to human rights groups from governments, from, from, uh, from authorities, from authoritarians, but uh, generally but from, from populists, but basically from all governments. And this thread, I believe, is not going to be met by going local, going to the grassroots. On the contrary, while going to the grassroots, at the same time, in parallel, I believe if the nature of the state is changing, it's becoming in many places of the world more oppressive, okay. uh, then <clears throat> the answer should be to strike back, actually to recentralize, to regroup, and to, um, to actually intensify, not everybody, you know, but, but intensify that part of the movement that is about shaming and, uh, and to build new positions also on uh, things like national identity, national security, and so on, to claim a civic patriotism in order to challenge the monopoly of governments and nationalists and populists okay, populist okay. in these issues. So but it's not the answer to oppression is not only to go grassroots. It's this and. So it's, it's not just that. It's, it's both going locally and actually going more centrally. Okay, Almut, um, one of the, when we're talking about these, uh, Dimitrina mentioned the threat that comes from governments. Um, that's amplified, of course, by their uh, repeated charge that human rights activities are foreign funded. Um, and um, you've been working for a number of years, Almut, on, uh, I, I don't know how to phrase it, but alternative resource mobilization strategies, which I take it to mean includes uh, weaning uh, local organize, weaning organizations off foreign funding. Um, can you tell us briefly about, um, you know, the success you're achieving in that in your work in the former Soviet Union, and maybe just give us an example of where you see that working? Right. So I want to first uh, step back a little bit to your last question about like how when you say how can you prove relevance? I don't think you can prove relevance. You can have relevance or you don't have it. If you have it, you don't need to prove it. Relevance is something you can't fake. Um, and, and that actually goes now to answer your question. So I don't actually try to wean grassroots groups of foreign funding because in order for that to do that, they would have to have lots and sufficient of grassroots of, of foreign funding to begin with and they don't. They, For most of them in the parts of the world that I work on and and that could be the North Caucasus in Russia, but that could also be small towns in Ukraine, or I've just visited Moldova, where outside the capital, it's much the same. Um, they sit there for years, hoping and praying and waiting for this foreign funding that's been dangled in front of them that doesn't usually come. So they just, for the most time, it's, it's, it's sort of a reality that sort of happens. And, it, you know, they think that this is, that their business model will eventually work out when finally this foreign funding materializes in a sufficient way and they just get bits and pieces every once in a while just enough to keep them waiting and hoping and in in that at that point i was you know i tried to step in and say like okay now let's look for something else um let's you know in a way the hope that this grant will this this, this sort of white knight donor will materialize that actually keeps them from looking at other resources and it also keeps them and, and something very important it keeps them from seeing the resource mobilization that they already do as equally legitimate and equally important. 
they always think of like when they raise a bit of money here and there from the community that that's just sort of like a, a temporary interim solution, something they should even be a little embarrassed about. And I try to tell them that this is actually great what you're doing, you know, a thousand euros that you can raise in your community is in so many ways much more valuable, much more important than, you know, a five figure euro grant you can get from a foreign grant maker. If, if, so, you're, sit if you're sitting with one of these organizations uh -huh. and they're embarking on this journey to anchor their work in local resource mobilization, yeah. and you just had to give them, you know, one or two very brief words of advice, what would it be? Uh, brief words of advice. Yeah, I wish there was an, a, a brief way to do this. Um, I would, well, I would, I would encourage them to face up to the reality uh, that they will never have enough from grants. Uh, if anything, it's been getting less and less. This is a reality that's completely obvious to everybody and to them as well. Uh, but it's it's almost as if they don't want to recognize this reality because that way they would jinx it, right? They have to keep hoping that the current lack of grants is just, it's like, a, it's a slump and it will go back to what they consider normal. Normal is usually a moment when for a very brief period, be it through during a humanitarian crisis or war or an intense period of reforms, a lot of grant money for some reasons was available and they created themselves either during that period or shortly thereafter, anticipating that this would be the normal. And, and, and I have to tell them, look, this is not the normal. And one thing I've advised them to do, and frankly, I've had a lot of resistance from them. That was like the hardest thing any of them, for any of them to do, many of them just, just all out refused, was to go to their donors, to their grant makers and ask them questions like, um, how long do you intend to be in this region? What are your plans? Where does your money come from? You know, do you even have control over where your money comes from? Is it even your own money? Can you, like, are you going to be there for us? And, and I told them, look, you asked this question as part of a sound financial planning. And it was really, really difficult for them to do it. They look with such deference at their donors. They prefer to look at them as some magical, you know, unknowable entity somewhere far away and just hope that it will work out for them. So I tell them the first advice, be, be realistic, look at the reality around you and see it for what it is. But then also the other hand, look at the reality around you that your community wants to support you and does it all the time. And like start to begin to see this as an actual, as a serious resource, like as something. I mean, in the, in the um, several years you've been doing this, have you seen have you seen success with organizations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of very good beginnings that then uh, again sort of sort of fall apart or, or or stop. And and one of the reasons is is that uh, organizations get very distracted by the by the prospects of grants. They okay. still see. Okay. And, and I have to say, these are the organizations I work with. These are that part of the ecosystem of civil society as a whole that created themselves on the expectations of grants and on the business model of grants. There are many, many entities and formats out there that were created in an entirely different way and they don't operate like this. And I'm not talking about okay. them. Um, so the successes were um, that, you know, they could basically, they could, they know best who to, who to ask and who to talk to. Um, and so in, in the North Caucasus, for example, the people that they first turned to were their former clients. That was that worked especially well for women's rights organizations, and we thought it was understandable because, well, in retrospect, it was to me it was very obvious, but at first, you know, it wasn't to our local colleagues. It was because these women's organizations were the only institution in the community that was on women's side. Everybody right. else, <clears throat> women's own families, the community, the society, the government, were not just against them, but like were violently opposed to their rights. Okay, all right. And the women's organizations were the ones to help them. So when they even just breathed you know a sign of, of needing help and money their former clients were only too happy to not just donate to them but also to go out and become volunteer fundraisers for them dimitrina um you uh you spoke earlier about um you know uh, to push back against the government attacks on human rights activity and i think we, we i think mo most would agree with you of course but um we you know we've talked about it, it, um, in these new models, we've talked about funding, but some would argue there's a method of work that's new, and that's to prioritize service delivery over advocacy, because service delivery, of course, is one key way to build a local constituency. Um, my question to you, Dimitrina, is 
advocacy has been so central to the public image, public advocacy has been so central to the public image of human rights groups, is it a necessary part of human rights work? Um, and is there, a, do you see a risk that in prioritizing service delivery, the advocacy component is lost or is this a false comparison? Uh, it depends uh, about, uh, it, it depends on the level of analysis. If we're talking about one human rights group, the, the, it's negative. The answer is no. No, it's not a necessary part. Uh, each group can choose its methods of work, and that can be research, but not advocacy, litigation, but not advocacy, service delivery, but not advocacy. However, it would be a huge pity if the human rights movement taken as a whole let's say at the regional or national level, loses the advocacy component. I think uh, there's something um, indispensable about advocacy. Now, it's another question whether advocacy itself should change in something. For example, in whether we should uh, try to revisit some parts of the, uh, of the framework, uh, of the reference framework. Uh, this is a different question, but advocacy as such, meaning you're, uh, you're trying to convince governments and other um, actors to uh, change their behavior, I think that's essential to human rights work generally. Okay. Not I, to each group in particular, but to human rights, the, the, to the movement taken a, a, as a whole, so to say. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to invite at this time uh, participants to pose questions using, again, remind you, use the uh, Q&A tab at the bottom and I'll pick up your questions and put them to the panelists. But uh, Alma, to go back to you again on the methods of work uh, that characterize uh, some of the organizations you're working with or that, that we're talking about, um, you know, some would argue that that the old model did not have a did not uh, require a membership. Although, of course, some of the classic human rights groups do have a membership, like Amnesty International. Mm -hmm. um, do you see Alma um, building a, a membership for these organizations as as important? And if so, you know, again, based on your experience, what advice would you give to those local organizations that intend to build a membership in order to, to anchor their constituency? I think it really depends. I think a membership never hurts, but I, but I also think that uh, it has to be, in order to be a, a truly positive beneficial factor, it has to make sense for that particular organization. And so in, in some cases, you know, memberships work really well if, um, if on the one hand, if it allows people to buy into a, a set of values, to like to be a card carrying ACLU member, right? It's, it's, a, it's sort of like you, you become part of this community, part of this values, this club of values. But the other thing would be that you, you buy into a community that together protects something that all of them have a shared interest in. So for example, in Kazakhstan, there is a new membership-based uh, initiative called OSA, which means WASP. Um, and what it does is, is car drivers. Car drivers are very effective by uh, sort of uh, small-scale uh, traffic police corruption. And they started, uh, basically, now you can become a member of this, this entity. What the members, you, what this does, like you get, like, it's like an insurance. You get, you know, like representation and you get legal help. But you also know that your incident of, like, when somebody, when a cop asks you for a bribe, that organization will put it online. Like they would, they film them on, on like, like dashboard cameras or on the phone cameras and they put it online and they put a sticker, like a bumper sticker on the car and police are, are so aware of this, you know, multiple, there's like tens of thousands of members in this, this, this club. And police are so aware of this, this club that they stopped stopping and asking for bribes cars that have that sticker on it. That's a great so, example. So yeah, so membership works if it, if it, if it serves a joint interest. Uh, for example, in my country in Austria, the largest membership organization is the Austrian Alpine Club, which has been around for 150 years. And it's like 10% of the population are a member of it or something. Now it doesn't protect rights as such, but you know, it protects something that is very essential or what Austrians think is very essential to their country the mountains um, and people's access to them. So when people feel that there's something at stake that really affects them, then membership can be really good. It can also be, like I said, really good if it's if it's an attractive value that they want to buy into. If it's something more- So not, for, it, not, 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 not for, its, for everybody. Not for its own sake, I think is your- Not for its own sake, not for its right. own sake. Now, now membership is one thing. There are other ways of having uh, sort of ownership you know, there can be different models of boards or of like beneficiary associations or self-help groups. 
I mean, you know, membership is also, it kind of sounds old. It's still great, but it sounds old. I, you know, like in, in the North Caucasus, in, in Chechnya, for example, I have a partner organization that helps the families of, of children with disabilities, primarily to like sort of fight for, you know, the benefits that they're entitled to from the government, access to schools, inclusion, treatment, and so, and so on. And they have hundreds and hundreds of families across the Republic organized in WhatsApp self-help groups. Elsewhere in the world, they would have a formal membership card. Okay. In Chechnya, that would be like weird. Like people don't think in those categories, but it functions exactly the same way, even more strongly, because these are effective self-help cells and groups. They're highly networked. Okay. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in now. Uh, Dimitrina, sure. you had mentioned that there were five threats. You only gave us two of them. Uh, a couple of our participants have asked you briefly to mention the other three threats. Yeah, that's very easy and I'll do it very quickly. So uh, just to re uh, recap, first threat from the public and it's expressed in the diminishing of legitimacy. Second threat from the government that the closing of spaces for human rights were. Third threat from civil society. A, from those parts of civil society that are not rights-based. B, from the proliferation of human rights work itself. The fact that now th that there's any number of issues that are, uh, that are framed as human rights issues, and that has, that's the problem of dilution of, of, of uh, the human rights movement. Four, threat from funders, because grant making itself, not only because there is a shrinking of, of, of the available money around the world, not that so much, but the, the constant stress on, on activists, the, the, the creation of clientele, the, the creation of a funder's profession, a tribe of funders that spend a lifetime be, being funders right. uh, and, and almost never cross over to see what it is to, to try to, uh, to apply for months. The success culture, the meal, the so-called monitoring and evaluation and learning. And somebody told me the other day that if you look at, for example, the, the British job market, uh, for civil society, let's say the charity job, the, the, the fastest growing and the largest number of positions that are open are for meal, for monitoring and evaluation and learning and so on. But does this really mean effectiveness? No, it doesn't. I think that's a different thing. And the fifth threat is the threat from within. The threat from within the human rights movement, the, the resistance to change. The fact that, what, what uh, Olmo talked about, that human rights veterans have difficulty, they're fastidious uh, it, it, when it comes to, uh, to asking their own, <laughs> uh, their own community for money. Uh, okay. and, and not only that, not only in fundraising, but also in the way we think about the relationship between, um, let's say, service provision and, and other work for-profit and non-profit, hybridization, so many other things that, that there's this huge resistance to change that comes from within a career in human rights and, and, and from the very mindset of, of the human rights defender. Okay, more so questions coming in. Threats. Thank you, thank you. Uh, very useful. More questions coming in here. Um, Almud, I'll put this one to you. Is there, um, uh, what one of our participants has said that maybe we're assuming there's, a, there's one model of, uh, uh, or one, single model to human rights advocacy. And isn't it the case that for different types of human rights, you need different types of advocacy, for example, between civil and political or economic and social rights, but your own area of course is women's rights and um, sexual violence. I mean, do, do you, it, it seems to me that um, this is often stated in, in at a kind of uh, formalistic level, but, but in practice, do you see the necessity for this and have you seen it concretely in your work? I mean, I would, when you were earlier talking about advocacy, I was already thinking, like, I don't usually use the word advocacy. I use the word communication because it's so much broader. And um, so I, I think, for instance, just social media blogging and, and even like messenger groups are vastly more effective, not just in reaching sort of like, like the community, but even those in power, because those in power respond to what's on social media a lot more than, you know, if there's a flash mob that that will affect or, or a big sort of social media driven movement like Me Too or it's equivalence in the former Soviet Union, which was called, um, I'm not afraid to say, uh, that reaches and touches those in power in the elites a lot more than 10 fantastically well-prepared advocacy reports. So, you know, I already like 
in our work, we already know that we have to do all of those things. Um, that we have, yes, the reports are important because with some people you need to put the facts on paper so that they will even listen to you. Um, like for example, and this is not just those in power, but those are also the mainstream media. The mainstream media react to a big report more than to just some social media blogs. But we're talking more about raising issues with the community because oppression and denial of human rights happens on the community level, not just from the government vis-a-vis -vis the citizens. And, and so this is where we need to have these conversations. And, um, and there are many different ways of, of having this conversation and putting this content out there and starting these discussions, um, you know, using, using arts, using culture, using social media, using very much again, like helping people, you know, the, the people who are concerned but have to express themselves in their own voice. And this would be especially true but those who are typically excluded, starting with young people, you know, make sure that young people can speak for themselves and that not people who are in their 50s speak for them. Okay. Um, so and that's another, what's already happening. If you don't see that happening, then you're not really looking. Can we do more of it? Of course. And then frankly, like we work on that every day. Okay. Um, another question which has come in, which I, I think might be on the minds of a number of people listening is, what is the role of transnational organizations that support these national or local activists in effective human rights advocacy in this new context and given the dearth of resources. What, what are local groups looking for most from transnational organizations? And I take it the questioner means not, uh, inter not um, governments, but uh, transnational civil society. To me? Yeah, to, I, I'd actually like a response from both of you. Yeah. Maybe, maybe first Dimitrina. You spoke about you spoke about the fifth threat coming from within the movement. Uh, do you see particular yes. threats that emerge there from the transnational aspect of that movement? Okay, I think everybody knows what the limitation, what, what the problems are uh, that come from international, large international NGOs that uh, and their unequal relationship to local NGOs and when it comes to funding and joint projects and, and all that. Yet, I personally wouldn't give up on either advocacy or international human rights organizations because that to me would, would just be a surrender of the international human rights framework. And all that I, I, I would strongly advocate for a renewal, but a renewal uh, I understand renewal not as abolishing what we have and building something from scratch. I, I think that would be, this would be a strategic mistake to the extent we still want, don't we, to defend the international human rights law regime and the democratic culture. I believe that uh, advocacy and therefore the role also of the, the large international human rights organizations, thinking of human rights, watch Amnesty and so on, uh, is a good thing. We shouldn't give up on that. With all that, I could talk for hours about all the problems uh, that, uh, that, that such organizations create for small entities on the ground. But with all said, in the end of the day, I think that, that they, they are uh, even more necessary today. And I don't think that that's conservative. I think that it's just, uh, we, we don't want to, to throw the baby out together with the water. This is okay. something that's an achievement. We, we want to, to keep it. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and, and it's a different thing that of course, uh, when it comes to funding, uh, these organizations themselves have a huge problem because you know, probably apart from Human Rights Watch, maybe they're secure, but most international human rights organizations that are more thematic, they have, they're increasingly uh, um, uh, challenged when it comes to, uh, to, to uh, funding themselves because funders, the funders uh, uh, themselves have changed. Now, these days, especially the new generation of the millennial funders, they want to go directly to the ground. They want to, to go directly to Zambia and to work directly with this LGBT group. And they don't care about some large entity that will uh, mediate because they you know, so the client, it's difficult for them too. I, I've been the director of two such okay. organization and, and I experienced the increasing difficulty of fundraising for an international human rights NGO, but they're necessary because they can be, uh, they, they can fill gaps. They are 
uh, they, they build a discourse. For example, the Equal Rights Trust built a discourse around the right to equality and uh, brought models of equality, uh, uh, equality law, um, equality legislation, equality policies to, I don't know, something like over 40 countries and trained civil society on what otherwise they wouldn't themselves uh, discover in, 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 in the in, in the short okay. term. So it, I, I it can did see, have a role. Yeah, I can see that uh, your point about the uh, lack of funding at the transnational level is resonating with uh, with some of the participants who are making and exactly And I think you point. too remember, because I think many, many years ago, we were somehow related, both of us, to uh, one uh, very useful international human rights organization, which is badly needed now, but now it's long dead. And that's the International Council on Human Rights Policy based in Geneva, which to my mind did wonderful things, but one day there was no more funding. Yeah, okay. Uh, Alma, do you have, um, uh, Dimitrina has argued the necessity of these organizations. Um, when you think about them in your context in the former Soviet Union, do you think there's something they could be doing differently? In other words, everybody can always do things differently. I want to say a, I just, a practical a quick, suggestion. Quick and very pragmatic answer. Um, to, in my experience, I work really well with Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International because at both of them, there's a small group of people who I have very, known very long and very well. And we just see eye to eye on many things and they can be fa fantastic partners on a lot of things. As long as we both understand that, you know, they have their own institutional priorities and, and ways of doing things. And I understand that, you know, grassroots groups and, and, you know, our partners have other interests and that we clearly understand where we overlap and where we can support each other and where it's just, you know, where we shouldn't expect too much from each other, then it can work fine. Um, they are sort of a, per a parallel track from what we're doing. We're not competing. Um, I think it, yeah, like it largely it largely depends on people. They have institutional constraints, some of which they created themselves, some of which they would rather not have and they would rather be able to do more. Um, but they're also, you know, facing huge challenges these days. So, um, but to me, fundamentally, they're an important player, but they're just one of them. Like, I wouldn't necessarily put them at a, at a central quintessential place in all of this. They're just one of the players. Okay. There's a question that's coming about the private sector, um, pointing out that it's, it, poses uh, risks to human rights, of course, but are there, uh, as we talk about these new models, are there opportunities there um, in terms of resource mobilization and partnership that we need to think about more so than in the past? Uh, Almut first and Dimitri, yeah. I'd ask you to comment on this as well. Again, the private sector is, is a very large sector, right? Um, resource mobilization, uh, I think, um, for, for example, we're right now we're thinking about um, you know women's rights in the post-Soviet context. A lot of it is in, in, in employment. So we don't just think of the private sector as a possible source of money that we can easily grab and do whatever we want to do with it. But it's more like, can we have a conversation with them about the gender pay gap, about um, sexual harassment in the workplace? Can we find partners there who, who, will, who are willing to transform their institutions, their companies, you know, in conversation with us? That's, that's more interesting to us. Um, but just to push the point on resource mobilization. <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, we do look, we will look for everything. We will look for every cent wherever we can find it. And uh, we do look very closely, like, you know, which organi which companies, you know, have, have an interest in, in doing like socially responsible things, you know, might be interested in the additional like um, advertising that comes with sponsoring someone. Um, we do approach them, you know, for, through uh, resource mobilization campaigns, but frankly, uh, just because these are huge sort of like buckets of money doesn't mean that you know we should be so vastly enamored enamored with them like um just, just I, I, I want to specify this is like so for example you know when when it was clear that you know grants from funders weren't going to come or were at some point going to end some uh, you know old business model NGO leaders stop. we just go to businesses. They also have large amounts of money and they will just buy, you know, ready-made projects off our hands and give us basically the equivalent of grants. That's not going to work. Businesses do this for, they have their own reasons for doing this thing. Um, and uh, for, for doing this at all. And um, in the same way, like it's, it's harder to have a conversation with them than with just members of the public for okay. money. 
Dimitrina, do you see these opportunities in your work now, in your new work in Bulgaria and Macedonia? About uh, uh, when it comes to, um, uh, to businesses as potential sponsors of, of human rights work, uh, Central Eastern Europe is a very difficult region. I believe the, um, um, the business and human rights movement, the corporate social responsibility is only starting. I think we are absolutely the last uh, in the world. And uh, there's nothing, at least to my knowledge, uh, in my part of the world, things like investor, um, uh, uh, investors for, for human rights, uh, um, you know, corporates that, uh, 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 that want to certify themselves as B corps and so on. Uh, th this is probably in the future. But what, uh, what I, I, I want to make a, a, a related point. Uh, I, I don't think it's the right thing for human rights groups to look around at possible funding opportunities simply for the sake of it. Uh, to me, what's fundamentally changed in, in these times and requires new models, uh, complementary to the old models, if not displacing them, uh, is, uh, is a need for human rights to look out of the box of human rights proper. Because now the, the, the main battleground of our times is between the illiberal populists on one hand and the authoritarians with them, and on the other hand, the liberals and the Democrats. And human, in the past, human rights groups could afford to be concerned about human rights, period. But because now there's this existential threat of the very, um, of, of the very uh, 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 existence of the human rights uh, framework itself, I think the mission of human rights groups now needs to, first of all, the mission needs to change. And then from there on, the alliances, and last, the resources. So I would go not from the resources toward how we find that potential donor, let's say a corporate, and then we seek in a fundraising kind of what they could now call it resource mobilization. But, but okay. you don't. <laughs> uh, you seek the interface with what they can. No, I, my approach would be that now we human rights groups have almost, I see it as a duty. It's noblesse oblige. We need to, to see ourselves as, as part of a broader pro democracy movement and build alliances with neighboring pro democracy movements, be it the <clears throat> environmental women and so on and so forth. And, and from the, we, even where it's not forming already in order to turn, uh, to, to turn the tide, human rights groups could be catalyzers of such pro-democracy movements. Okay. They're, they're called <clears throat> upon to do so. And with that will come the diversification of the funding portfolio. Okay, so this um, uh, building of alliances, uh, <clears throat> you very eloquently uh, put this argument about the duty of of reaching out, of looking differently, of building alliances and meeting the new threat. Um, one of the uh, our participants has put the question that we put at the beginning and, and didn't quite drill down deeply enough on, which is about what really distinguishes the new model. So maybe building alliances is one of the points. You passionately argued that, Dimitrina. Almut, I'll come back to you. I put this to you earlier, but is there something else about this new model we can point to? Building alliances earlier, you mentioned this need to, about uh, prioritizing the voice and amplifying the voice of the grassroots and the people affected. Is there something else, Almut, that you would say distinguishes um, this new model of human rights work that we're talking about? Um, it may be that it is not, that it doesn't see as it's, as a big part of its purpose, the creation of long-term institutions, sort of freestanding long-term institutions. It may be more ad hoc. It may be more about campaigns and, you know, flash mobs and movements that sort of form and, and do their thing and then turn into something else and not so much. Um, there's always a big thing in sort of the traditional old model is always like institution building, capacity building. And it's always like, you know, do we have a space? Do we own this office building? Do we have our staff? Are they trained? Do we have enough certificates hanging on the wall? Um, and I think maybe the new model will be a bit more fluid and it will be a bit more of a citizen non-professional stepping up and taking responsibility as groups, as collectives, um, ideally in an intersectional way, you know, through building coalitions for a period of time and, you know, then maybe move on, maybe go into politics, maybe go back to their private lives, maybe create an organization, but let's hope not always because that's basically where 
where good ideas and, and real mobilization goes to die, frankly. Um, oh. So, Dimitri, uh, do you do you see it, this it as well? This fluidity, momentary and more fluid. Do you, do you agree, Dimitrina, this kind of this idea of this uh, fluidity of the nature of the work, not necessarily focused on institution building, but mobilizing in an ad hoc and opportunistic way? Yes. Uh, however, one, one important caveat, um, I think it, it was earlier this year, I, I read two fascinating books, uh, uh, both on the same topic of why some movements succeed and others fail, and the lessons of both, uh, they were... Uh, Zainab, uh, Tupac Chi, uh, one book, and another by Crutchfield, Leslie Crutchfield, uh, both asking which movements uh, succeed and why. And <laughs> it's uh, uh, a kind of a uh, counterintuitive conclusion, which they make on the, on the basis of huge empirical research over a very long period of time, um, which is that these things which are, are, are flash mobs and those flexible uh, alliances and uh, joining this group or that and, uh, uh, and all this networked protest is very unsustainable. Uh, and uh, and they give, give the examples of the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement and the Arab Spring, which failed because of something they lacked. And what they lacked is old fashioned organization, organizing organizing and organizing with clear lines of uh, responsibility with everybody knowing what they're doing with 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 you know with with internal procedure internal de democratic decision making deliberate everything that characterizes good old organizing but, but that those that that actually do that they succeed and those who rely only on on the more fashionable uh, fluid you know, movements that are not based on more solid organization, uh, they're very transient, they, they're, they're very ephemeral. Although they organize, uh, that may not contradict Alnwood's point about institution mm. building, may just about being, about being better organized. Alnwood, did you want to respond on that point? Um, no, I think no? we'll okay. go on. Okay, so um, there's a, there a couple more questions which have come in which take us back to the funding. Um, even though we've discussed this, and I, I, I do want to raise them again. Um, people are looking for, people, there's some skepticism in the questions about the actual ability to mobilize resources locally in your region or in other, reason, uh, in other regions, um, and, and questions about really the, the realistic ability to do that on unpopular issues, for example, LGBTQ issues. Um, you work on women's rights and sexual violence that may also be an unpopular issue. Uh, um, so again, I take both of you back because you are, you know, engaged in particular regions uh, around questions of resource mobilization. Is this really possible? Um, how much you've said it's, you've seen success, but um, how far can it go? What are the limits of that local fundraising model? And I'll put the question to both of you. First to you, Almut. We haven't even scratched the surface on it yet, but every time I go and we scratch the surface a little bit, I am surprised and I am just inspired and, and just th just blown away. I mean, just to give you an example, one of the things I always tell when I, I do this work with activists, and this is something I had to learn myself, do not underestimate your communities. They are a lot smarter. They're a lot more civic minded. They're a lot more open minded and they're a lot more generous than you give them credit for. And, and every time we do this, uh, we find that this is true. So for example, when I was working about a year ago with human rights defenders in Central Asia, we did an experiment where we brought in the actual man and woman off the street so that they could, you know, sort of in, 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 a, in, a, in a playful situation, decide who they would fund. And we had local activists pitch their projects to them. And uh, one of the activist groups pitched uh, the protection of a long imprisoned human rights defender in Kazakhstan. Uh, they wanted to get health care, uh, like so, support for his health care, but also publish his books. And, and I didn't say anything, but I thought, yeah, you're just barking up the wrong tree. You know, the man and the woman on the street doesn't care about an imprisoned human rights defender. Wrong. I was completely wrong. That was the thing where people didn't, the, the man and woman of the street didn't just donate like the play money we had given to them, the monopoly money, but one of them donated her own money and not a little, around $20, which is a lot of money. This is like 20% of a, you know, of a monthly income or so in Kyrgyzstan to this imprisoned human rights defender. And so every time we do this, we are surprised by how open-minded and, and how flexible people are. 
And um, unfortunately, in my own work, trying to encourage local groups to do this, I'm totally constrained because these these projects and these programs are always so time limited. I can, like this thing in, in Central Asia, I was literally able to work with them for half a day. Um, I knew if I'd been able to stay there with them for a few months and we just keep it up. And, and every day I ask them to spend a few hours on this or just an hour because they're very busy, right? Like we have to also like help them be able to do this labor, this new additional labor. Mm -hmm. But I knew if we had this time, we could, we could go a lot further. And, you know, like, so some of them would say, but, you know, but now I have a hundred thousand euros a year from grants, you know, more or less stably. So, and I can never replace it. And I would say, well, of course you can't replace it immediately. And also I'm not telling you to stop accepting grants while you can. I'm telling you to start building that base and over the years it will grow. And eventually you may reach a, a very substantial level of success, but we've seen, okay. <clears throat> I um, think it's possible. Uh, Dimitrina, quickly, um, are you in agreement with Amit on this point? Uh, I, sort of uh, you know, optimistic? I, I encourage people to uh, read uh, Almut's uh, article in Opal Global Rights. It paints such a, um, uh, an over, um, a, a, a super positive, I, I would even say a euphoric picture of, of how there's this vibrant uh, civil society in Russia that somehow manages to fund itself and so on. I very much wish she's right. Uh, my experience doesn't confirm that. Not that there are no such examples. Yes, there are. But A, this is a very big place, Russia, Eastern Europe. So if you have even, let's say, if you're familiar with 20 examples, 200 examples, we are talking about huge spaces here, huge societies, many societies. So even if you put together all these examples, uh, you could still find yourself, if you travel there, which is my case, uh, in a sort of a desert in terms of human rights activism. And yes, you, you may occasionally hear. Second, uh, these donations which would come from the local community, they really are very contextual. Some issues are easy to, to fundraise, easier than others. Okay. Third, these donations are very small. For example, in Russia, for example, the, uh, uh, if you read the article about this OVD info group, well, they raised in the best of time for real human rights work, they, they raised $35,000. Compared to grants that come from large foundations, that's little. Okay. And All actually, right. my experience in Bulgaria and Eastern Europe is, 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 uh, is quite sobering because I was, I still am a huge enthusiast and I tell everybody, let's try everything. Absolutely, I'm all for it. The results, however, have been a bit underwhelming. Um, right. But we have to keep trying. I, I think that, yeah, I guess that, that's the point is um, in so far as we've been talking about ways of doing things differently, it's in some ways it's, it's early days. So there's, yeah. there, there's a lot ahead of us where we've yeah. run out of time. Um, there's a couple more questions coming in. I'm sorry, I won't be able to deal with them, but our webinar is coming to an end. I'd like to thank um, everyone involved. Uh, a virtual clap for our two panelists. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Dimitrina and Almud. I think it's been really informative and I think we could have, in fact, we probably should uh, have another discussion uh, on these issues because there's a lot to talk about and a, and a lot of learning that can be taken from this. I would just remind participants again that there's going to be a recording of this which will be posted on the uh, Rights Collab and Open Global Rights uh, websites in due course. And uh, finally, to participants who um, listened in, as you exit, you'll be prompted to do a survey on what you thought about the interest and the effectiveness of, of the webinar. It'll only take you really about 60 seconds. So as you log out, we hope you'll do that survey to help us improve how we do these webinars in the future. Once again, thanks very much to everyone, both who listened in and to our panelists and to Rights Collab and Open Global Rights for hosting this. Thank you. Thank you.